this session is to turn the tables a bit. Uh, we'll go through um, a bit of background on who of all of our uh, pitchers are um, and go through sort of a bit of what's in it for you in terms of the work they're doing and also give you a bit of a sense of the kind of work that corporates are trying to engage with and, and how reciprocal it can actually be in terms of the partnerships that can come um, from all of it. Nisha will go through a bit of the outline of the session. Yeah, so the format we'll follow is pretty simple. We'll ask each of the corporates to come and pitch to, uh, to all of you. They'll take all of five to seven minutes to do it. And then Amanda and I will ask some questions, some follow-on questions. But at the end of all the four pitches, we'll open it up to you. And we don't want to make it a panel discussion, guys. So ask questions. So ask questions. <laughs> it's for you. OK? So with that, we'll get right in. So I invite Harsha Angeri of Bosch to go first. And he specifically asked me to say that Bosch is an industrial conglomerate. So, Harsha, all yours. <laughs> right from here? No, which, oh. whichever way. <laughs> okay, I'll just stand this work. Yeah. Okay, how many of you have seen gorillas? Great. So, when entrepreneurs work with uh, corporates, they call it dancing with the gorillas. So, I am the gorilla. So, I'll come back to that. So, we are Bosch, 54 billion euros globally, 2 billion euros in India, 10 manufacturing plants, 4,500 dealerships. So, if you've got to move boxes in the country, we are the ones to... Uh, really talk to. So we are building businesses in healthcare, food, water, energy, and so on. So these are the areas of focus for us. Uh, we are real. So we already have released an eye care product, two uh, startups from Europe, one from India. We already have delivered them purchase orders greater than the cumulative orders that they have received wow. so far in two months of sales. That's what we can bring to the table. We are also running one of the biggest malaria pilots in India, along with actually Rockefeller Foundation and some startups. So that's kind of what we bring to the table. So 14 live projects, 27 partners at a global level. So that's kind of how we work. So the philosophy is let be, let's be patriotic about the problem, but not about the solution. So the solution can come from anywhere. So that's kind of how we focus on uh, some of these areas. We also have a role of acquirer. So there are two roles that we play as an incubator where we work with you to actually, you know, take the idea to shape and also as an acquirer. Why should you work with us? It's your passion, your idea. I'm sure you want to scale it, right? So if there are two numbers you want to remember today, it is 8 and 92. That's kind of how we work. In the kind of industries that we work in, normally 8% of your costs go into R&D and 92% goes into everything else. So India, we have seen, is a graveyard of innovation pilots. There are tons of innovations that happen, but they never scale because everybody focuses on the eight and not on the 92. So if you want to, a partner who can focus not just on eight, but also on the 92, again, it's with us. So again, as I said, it's your passion, your area. Bosch as a company is driven by a foundation. So our value systems are different, very much aligned to the social entrepreneurship space. We call ourselves invented for life. So whatever we invent, it has to last a lifetime. So that's kind of how we approach this. So if you want to see your journey to fruition, we have a great process, a SME-oriented process that, that can make it work for you. So come and talk to us in all these uh, areas. So I'll come back to the gorilla point. So actually, Nisha here always teases me that I am a corporate ivory tower. You have all seen gorillas. They walk with hands and legs. They are absolutely grounded. We are grounded. <laughs> if you actually compare human genes with gorilla genes, I don't know how many of you know it, 95 to 99% matches. So if you as entrepreneur wants to work with anybody, it is with the gorillas because we are the same. <laughs> and there is always this notion about big corporates eating up startups. For your information, gorillas are herbivores. We will never eat you. <laughs> so come talk to us. Health, energy, food, water, other spaces. Thank you. Awesome. So Harsha, I have a question for you. I gave two minutes back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you gave us two minutes. So my question for you is you are urging entrepreneurs to come and talk to you, right? And very often we have seen that if the entrepreneurs are specifically in the business of product, just like you are, and it's not a service-oriented business, then who owns the IP? This becomes a big battleground act, typically, when an entrepreneur works with big corporates, because we have seen that the 800-pound gorilla wants to have all the IP in the room. Okay, so 
there's this concept of, uh, again, I'll take the same device that we are talking about. So there's a hardware and there's a software. There's something called pre-IP. So the startup brought the pre-IP with respect to the hardware, so they own it. You know, they completely own it. We pay for that intellectual property, but we are taking it directly into the market. The software is something that we brought into the table, so that IP is ours. We are going to modify the product. The same startup is going to build the product for us, the next generation. We pay the startup. So some of the pre-IP is again licensed, but what we pay for is owned by us. So it's a pretty clean uh, structure in terms of who owns uh, what in that sense. So what you already own, you already own. And if you modify, that is when we figure out who owns uh, what, if you will. Okay. And one more quick question on that. In terms of global company, you're working in a lot of areas, and obviously each market that you're working in has different challenges around uh, the problems that you're facing. Do you, do you focus on where these solutions are being made? Um, and also, does it matter where the entrepreneur thinks that their product will have the most um, resonance or impact? Or do you guys sort of choose for them or alongside the other products you have and decide what markets it will fly in? Yeah, so I think we have a process where we come pretty much a market backwards. So we identify areas. Like I said, I already said ophthalmology, malaria, Oral cancer is another focus area. So a lot of these areas we identify and then scout for the startups. So typically it works. Of course, there are a lot of startups that come to us and say, hey, this is uh, something that we have. So as I said, we are not patriotic about where the solution comes from. The focus is on we have to solve the problem and put all your resources uh, behind that. So as we go through that journey, changes do happen. I mean, it's like any relationship, right? Changes do uh, happen. But otherwise, we are not focused on where it comes from. And a lot of it today, global platforms and so on, a lot of it does come from the Western uh, world, which is actually good for a country like India. Can you give one example of something that came from the Western world that's now been applied here? Yeah, so as I said, if you take something like uh, image processing algorithms, detection capability, one of the best capabilities for that is actually in Heidelberg. So they had never thought about India. So we went, actually, it was another reverse pitch. So we went, literally pitched to them, saying that they need to come here. So it was something that we did. So now that is, uh, whatever, put in a lot of low-income states here, where we are trying to do automated uh, detection of uh, medical conditions in the eye and so on. Okay. Um, before I go on to the next pitch, can you give guys hear us all right? You can? Yes. Great. So. <laughs> All right, so you guys can ask the other questions that you have for Harsha, but before we get to that, I'd like to invite Ajay Krishnan from Cisco. You know Cisco is a tech major, so Ajay, all yours. Okay, uh, I won't go too deep into Cisco. My name is Ajay Krishnan. Uh, Cisco carries about 80% or 70% of the world's internet traffic. And anytime you do a Google search, the traffic generally travels on Cisco networks. Okay, so what we started doing in India two years or three years back was that generally technology comes from the West and it is used by developing countries for our requirements. We decided to change the paradigm and we said, let us develop something in India for the developing countries. Cisco has got about 11,000 engineers based out of Bangalore. So we said, let's make use of some of this IP which is present here or the intellectual capital that is present here. So we started on this journey of inclusive growth where we said we will focus on just three areas. One is education, second is skills development, the third is the area of healthcare, right? So I'll talk specifically about education and skills development and touch a little bit upon uh, healthcare. In education, the biggest problem is in India, for example, you have 1.3 million schools, four and a half million teachers. On an average, it works out to be about three to three and a half uh, teachers per school. But most of these teachers are in the urban areas. So when you come to a rural area, even a semi-rural area, you have one or two teachers per school, and even in a tier two or a tier three town, generally you find that the quality of the teachers may not be as good as what you would expect to find in a Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore, and so on. So how do you solve this problem? Now for those amongst us who are really, you know, the diehards in education, the best way to teach, and I agree, is to have a good teacher in the classroom. But what if that good teacher is not there, and surely the numbers don't support it? What is the next best solution is to virtually transport the teacher into a classroom, right, so that the teacher can now teach. It is better to have a virtual teacher in the classroom teaching to the kids the correct fashion. And trust me on this, when I went to an engineering college, spoke to electrical engineering students, 
first year electrical engineering students, and I asked them to define what is voltage. So I asked them to explain what is voltage. Everybody is coming back to me with the definition, Ratawa definition. Right? Nobody is able to explain to me what is voltage. Okay? Like this, I can give you any number of examples. So the concepts are not there. So unless there is a good teacher in the classroom explaining to the students, the kids are not really going to understand. Likewise, when you look at skills development, good quality trainers are available there in Bombay, are available in, Bhopal, uh, in a place like Bangalore, but not really maybe in a place like Bhopal, definitely not in a place like Devas. Okay? So now when you are talking about rural India and good trainers, how do you get the good trainers there? The traditional model has been the trainer either goes to town to town to town, teaches 20, 50, 100 kids, or the kids come to, or the youth come to a location and get trained by somebody and then go back, right? That is expensive, that is a conventional way of teaching and training. What has Cisco done? Again, using virtual classrooms, say for example in Kerala, we have taken 34 government ITIs and it's a commercial project, this is not CSR. None of what I'm talking about is CSR, right? We have taken a virtual classroom where trainers from Pune, Malayali speaking trainers from Pune, are training students in ITIs in Kerala. Inspired by what is happening from Pune, the, uh, the Keralaite ITI instructors themselves woke up and they said, look, we got to take, go ahead in this. And today, they are taking the maximum number of classes. So the guy, a good uh, guy, a machinist who used to teach only, say, for example, in Trivandrum ITI, is now able to teach somebody in Palakkad. He is also able to teach somebody in Kori Kod, right? And this, we extended it to Bihar where we are training nurses. We know nothing about nursing training. We know only about technology. More than technology, we now have developed the know-how on how to make and orchestrate all of these things to happen. First question that comes up in rural India is that there is no electricity. Bijli nahi hai ji. Right? Second thing, network hai nahi. As secretary told me in Bhopal about two and a half years back, Ajay, in my room, in the secretariat, there is no broadband connectivity and you are telling me you are going to do something in Datiya? Not possible. I said, sir, give me six months, we'll show it to you how it can be done. Today, there are more than 200 locations across India where this stuff is happening. In Bihar, we have been training nurses. We know nothing about nursing training, but there's a leading public health education organization, an NGO, which works with us. So for all of these activities, we make use of NGOs, training organizations, entrepreneurs who are engaged in these type of activities. So look at it this way, that we have essentially built a sort of a mini cinema theater or a virtual classroom where teaching, learning, training, skilling, any kind of communication can happen. You are the participants who are going to make this a success. Your organization, your trainers, your skills are what is going to make this a success. You leave the technology to us, right? We will ensure that things work. That's what has happened. Multiple governments, whether it's Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, and now many other states are falling in line, they're all coming to us. So if they can afford it, you can too. And we'll work with you, right? We are a gorilla, of course. Uh, you know, all the analogies do stay, but we'll work with you. That's our mission. We are called Inclusive Growth at Cisco. Thank you. So my question for you, Ajay, is that in a country where there is so much unemployment, there are so many people, um, what should we focus on? Should we focus on skilling people so that people get interaction and the skills they need? Or should we take everything virtual? Um, what's, maybe there's no one good answer, but what do you think should be the it focus? It is everything. It's everything. The answer is everything. You've got to educate the child. And once the child comes to a certain age, if the child has got scholastic aptitude, then he goes on for further studies. In, in our case, we have given them special coaching so that they can do the cat mat rat exams, or they can be skilled so that they get a job as a technician somewhere else. And let me tell you this, I can, I'm talking about a virtual, scale, a virtual skilling or virtual teaching. There is no difference. Talk to the students, talk to the government officers who are experienced this, there is no difference. In Bihar, in nursing, Places like Samastipur, nursing, nursing school or college, pass percentage before this happened was zero. After this happened, within seven months, the pass percentage has gone up to 72%. Okay, it's as good as having a damn good teacher there. That's the difference. 
Are you thinking of training the trainers kind of programs? Yeah. Because at some point, you need people, right? Yes. You are. So, yes. So, wherever we go, whatever we do, we want to see, for example, it's very easy to say that, say, for example, take Karnataka. In schools, we'll bring in teachers from the outside multiple problems associated with that. The first one is the political one. You have immediately made all the teachers your enemy, right? Number two, you got to co-opt them in the process. The state government has got four and a half lakh teachers, right? There is bound to be at least 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 of these people who are damn good, right? It's just that they're there in the government system. That is not to say that they are all bad teachers. At least 5,000, 10,000 of them are good. If you just give them proper inputs, you know, then they start using the platform and they become uh, good. Just last question, since this is not CSR for you and this is more inclusive business, uh, what is in it for Cisco? Yeah, it's uh, a small profit, what I call a sustainable profit. Otherwise, you can't generate these programs and make these programs grow. Mm -hmm. uh, if an NGO can afford it, if governments are buying it, if other partners are willing to come with us, I'll give you the name of an organization, NTTF, Network Technical Training Foundation. It is the IIT of technical education. They're using us. And today it has come to such a stage that NTTF is recommending us to their corporate partners. Tata Steel, for example. Okay, in Jamshedpur, there's a center. And there are all the problems. Even the expert trainers are not there everywhere. Expert trainers are hard to come by. Just to follow on to that point, um, how you mentioned the sort of skepticism, sort of how are you going to get to our school and make sure this works? What kind of guarantee do you give both the trainers and also the areas that are now using this virtual technology that you're going to be around um, even if, for example, profits fall in that certain area or you haven't gotten enough referrals? Are you in this for the long run in these yes. areas? Yes. Um, and how do, you, how do you assure that um, in the communities? Okay, the only way to assure this is volumes. Okay, the only way to assure this is volumes. So you make small profits, but the volumes are large. It's essentially a Walmart model, right? So the volumes are large, and God knows we need it. Tell me another example or give me another answer. Generally, companies tend to throw technology into the problem. And what happens is that's a part of CSR. In two years' time or one year's time, the CSR money runs out. Everybody shakes hand and goes home. What happens to those people on the ground? Okay, the only way to solve this problem is to have a sustainable business model which is going to help you resolve this problem. There is no other way. And there are not enough teachers, there are not enough trainers, and there are not enough doctors. Now let me tell you the last point about healthcare. We ran a pilot on healthcare using Cisco Health Presence platform. It is not the high-end telepresence platform that we have in San Jose. We have developed a low-end model for India, for example, or all developing countries. We deployed this in two states, Karnataka and Madhya Pradesh. Remote districts, Gwalior, Datiya, Sihor, Chindwada, tribal district. Uh, you know, so there in 18 months, 65,000 consultations. People who had never seen even an MBBS doctor now got access to a specialist, a doctor, a super specialist. Kids were treated, lives were saved. There is no answer to this. I'll tell you very practically. I asked my friend who teaches in Indore Medical College. He said, Ajay, why on my right mind would I go and work in Chindwada? Would you go and work in Chindwada? The answer is no. And even if I were to tell you yes, at that point of time, I met with the collector of Chindwada. Just in the evening when we were talking, he told me something very, I said, sir, you are here, how, how is ma'am liking the place? He said, Ajay, Raja hai, Rani nahi hai. Okay, the Rani lives in Delhi with the children so that the education can be given. And that's the fact of life. So, Everybody wants to come to a big town, big city. I was speaking to a leading institution which talks about educating teachers, for example. They really believe in doing this face to face. Right? But when they train the teacher, the teacher stays on in, say, Bangalore. Nobody is going to the remote area. So, how do you overcome this problem, technology? My time is up. Yes. Right? So, we'll go to Google next. We have Suhair Khan and Gautam Gandhi. It's one of you. Hi, how are you? Uh, thanks for everyone for coming. Thank you for setting up this panel for us. I'm Gautam Gandhi. I am uh, leading a new business development initiatives at Google. And I'm going to introduce my colleague Suhair. I just want to tell you about two programs first before uh, we get into what we're pitching. Uh, one is that uh, Google works very closely with a lot of nonprofits. So we have a website, google.com slash nonprofits. You can see our available tools. And we're also very friendly towards entrepreneurs, google.com slash entrepreneurs. 
So we have a lot of tools that are available across uh, a lot of our different platforms, Google Apps, email, YouTube, uh, Maps, and so on and so forth. But today, we're actually here specifically to continue on the theme that Ajay started about education and what can Google do and how we can partner with entrepreneurs to help in education and specifically, so here's going to talk about increasing access to education, creating relevant content for education, and as well as increasing overall usage. So I'll hand it off to Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Gautam. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, great that we have so many conversations around education today in this panel or in this pitch session. Um, I'm working on um, building out for Google ecosystems around our education products in Asia overall. And right now, we're very much focused on India. Um, Google has had over the years many products in the education space. We have the entire device ecosystem, so you're all familiar with Android tablets. Uh, they're used in schools all over the world. We now have the Chromebook devices, um, which are cloud-based computer solutions. Uh, they now comprise 30% of all school devices in the US, and we're scaling up rapidly uh, across the world as well as in India. And then we have the entire content e ecosystem, the apps on the Play Store, the Chrome Web Store. Um, and that is something that we're very much focused on building out, specifically in emerging markets, as we think about digitizing uh, educational content. Um, and then the last kind of major bucket is the other products that we have. We have YouTube for Education. Uh, YouTube in India has about 55 million users. And one of the largest segments uh, or searches is for education as a subject area. Um, again, this is something that we want to start to integrate as we create um, more of a package solution around education at Google for our partners. Um, so where do you guys come in? Well, Gotham also has mentioned that we're looking now in India at a few very specific buckets uh, to build out um, what we think is an important ecosystem. We can't just bring in our devices. We can't just ask people to go on to the Play Store. We want to facilitate both uh, relevant content um, in a country-specific context, looking at curriculum, looking at language, as well as access to our products. Um, so connectivity is a huge issue right now in India. Schools are not online. We're working very hard to think about uh, packages with various partners. How do we create internet connectivity solutions for schools across the country in a way that is very scalable? Um, so that's one huge bucket. The second, as I mentioned, is content. Um, we need people to start bringing their content online. I've already met a few amazing organizations that are working on building out India-specific content for um, classrooms. We don't just focus on that. We're looking at testing apps. We're looking at uh, learning apps that are not just classroom-specific, skills that go beyond uh, just learning in the classroom. And this is both country-specific as well as global. Um, we want you to start to bring that content online, to start to build out apps um, around it. Not just web apps, but Android-based apps, Chrome-based apps, and we want to figure out ways in which we can facilitate creating these opportunities for you. We don't own uh, the IP. Uh, we're just in the business of opening up the space and helping to make sure that you know that there's opportunities out there for you to bring your products to a much larger audience than you potentially are reaching right now um, and working with you on that. Um, the second side is, I don't know how many developers there are in the room. How many of you are tech-focused? Can I? Are there any developers over here? OK, enough. Fair amount. Um, so we're also looking to get you to start looking at education, start building out apps in education. Uh, we want to help to create distribution channels to um, bring your products to schools, to homes, um, not just in India, but around the world. And we're looking to work with you and to engage with you both in kind of providing you with an overview of what's already out there, and secondly, what's needed, both in an India-specific context as well as globally. Um, and the last thing is we're working on a lot of outreach. We're running hackathons. Uh, we're looking to engage with the ed tech space. Again, I know there's tons of people here who are looking at education technology. Um, we're not the experts. We're here to uh, create a platform to bring your ideas and your products online and to schools. And so um, you know, if anybody has any ideas, if anybody wants to get engaged on that front, we're also looking to start conversations in India right now. Um, and I think I'm perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. perfect time. Round of applause. 
Thanks for that. So we have heard two education uh, sort of related pitches in a row, and I'm just thinking connectivity, a really big issue. Um, also, it was interesting the number of hands that came up when you asked about developers. And I think if we look at the training, once you're connected, the training, and then also the platform that's able to be built, are you partnering up with other organizations or interested in any organizations in the room that are trying to build an ecosystem around um, developing talent in this area and, and encouraging people to start building their own apps? Absolutely. So in terms of connectivity, I mean, that is a very um, a huge gap in the space right now. It's not just specific to emerging markets. Um, we've realized actually in the course of this work and this project that we've undertaken that connectivity in schools is not... Uh, is, is an issue if you're not in the US or if you're not in Western Europe. Um, so we're looking at how we can make this scalable and also high quality. Uh, if you bring a Chromebook device into a classroom, you do need high-speed internet, and we strongly believe that um, you know, middle-of-the-road solutions are not the best way of uh, getting people online in the classroom. We want you to be able to share your documents with other kids in the room. We want the teacher to be able to manage uh, 50 kids in a room using one laptop to uh, see their test scores, to see their progress. And so for all of that, being on the internet is a huge plus. Having said that, um, a lot of these apps also will work offline. We realize that it's not going to happen overnight, but we're working on a major push towards, um, at least in urban centers, uh, starting to create solutions, to pilot solutions with schools, with institutions, um, and figuring out you know, for each country what, what makes the most sense in terms of growing. In terms of otherwise partnering with organizations, definitely, you know, number one, we're looking at developers, we're looking at content producers. We want them to come together and to start creating apps to build out that ecosystem. Um, you know, again, education is such a big focus area of parents, of families in India. Uh, everybody realizes that some sort of technology will be beneficial um, to learning, whether it's supplemental, whether it takes over the entire classroom, whether it's after school. Um, and we just want to make sure that we're helping to drive that forward. And we want to make sure that the tech community starts to get engaged in that as well. So just a question, uh, Suhair. So you're asking people to digitize content and put it up there, right? Um, while I understand you are not a CSR initiative, how would you give back to the community? Would you put analytics behind it? Would you maybe, you know, down the road, help improve curriculum itself? How do you see the larger play here? So I can speak to that, and I think Gotham has some thoughts on that. We are not um, an education company. We're not looking to uh, decide, you know, what content is best um, and who should be making it. Uh, we do want to work with what you know, we see as premier organizations or groups um, you know, in the space, but we're here to facilitate anybody who wants to bring their products to our, our web stores, for example, and, and let it be kind of uh, you know, a democratic process with users. You have something to add? I was going to say, you know, uh, Google's like a platform, and if you remember the, the mission of our company is to sort of organize the world's information. And if, they are, if there is good content that's available, but that's not accessible, it's almost like it doesn't exist. And it's really up to the public and up to the users to decide what is good content and what is bad content. So we, we have a platform that's available, but we are not the deciders. But once all that content is surfaced, the, it automatically, the good content will propagate to the top, right? Um, and this happens very, like with YouTube, for example, is a, is a classic example or even with a lot of apps. There's millions of apps in the App Store, but the, the good apps always find themselves up, up to the top. So I think that um, you know, a lot of people get worried about, oh, if I put my content online, uh, what if it's not good enough? You have to put yourself out there, and if you don't put yourself out there, you'll never know. And, um, and only through the feedback from the user community will you actually have an op opportunity to improve your content with having that feedback loop, which you may not have uh, otherwise, if you're in a closed content um, walled garden, so you know, if you're like a textbook manufacturer, you're handed that textbook and the students and teachers cannot be interactive, cannot participate, it's actually very hard for them to actually improve those books. But being online, you actually have an opportunity to engage, and I think that's the, that's the biggest value add. Can I just quickly follow on to that as well, because um, I know Google, sort of, you can promote as a business director myself, there's ways in which content that might not otherwise 
rise naturally could potentially um, get to the people who would need it most. And I think we're talking about even just if we go back to the training, the trainers and some content that um, maybe people aren't searching for, but, but often need. And I know that it's just a platform, but in terms of some of the entrepreneurs in the room who have new content that they think is really valuable for some communities, but to be honest, they're not sure what keywords uh, to use. Is there any uh, support that Google provides? Well, if you look at the stores, if you look at the Chrome Web Store, for example, there are buckets right now for different kinds of apps, even within education. You can obviously search. Um, but there are ways of organizing that content in a way that um, you know, brings up those particular apps. Um, I, you know, we're open to feedback, obviously, but having said that, it is organized in a way right now where you will get featured in the, the category in which um, you are, as long as you know, people are, the quality is good. Great, so guys. we have the last one here, but not the least. So, <laughs> so Deepak, you are up next. Uh, Deepak is with Unilever. Um, you know it's a large FMCG company, but Deepak is, represents the water business of Unilever. So Deepak, all yours. Thank you, Nisha. Good afternoon, my friends. Uh, my name is Deepak Saxena, and I, I work with the water business of uh, Unilever. Water business at the moment means purit devices and uh, Mumbai specifically happens to be the global category headquarters for Unilever water business. So from here it's, it's, it's sort of uh, promoted in India and uh, exported to around 14 countries and counting uh, after this. So uh, you know our, our first colleague uh, uh, speaker Harsha from uh, Bosch uh, compared uh, a large company to a gorilla and which was a very apt uh, comparison. I would like to uh, compare a large company to a fortress or a large spaceship where you, when you look at it, you don't see any openings in it. And you really don't know how to, how to get inside, whom to talk to. And you know, it's, it's daunting. So in a, in a little way, I will try to provide you with a small little opening into uh, uh, Unilever, and you can of course write to me uh, to, to uh, get in touch with or, or get access to people within Unilever. But I am more knowledgeable and, and authorized to speak about the water business, so I will restrict my comments uh, to water business of Unilever. Actually, you know, before I came here, there were, when I was thinking I, that what to do and what to speak, what more, what can I offer? There were two or three pages of notes that I could sort of fill. And uh, when I landed here, I was told that uh, we have five minutes and, and our judges are going to sort of judge. So I said, well, I can't go through all this in five minutes. So then I sort of quickly wrote a few points on the back of my card. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll sort of uh, restrict myself to few comments which I have on my card and I hope that uh, uh, they will be explicit, they are simple. I mean we are not high tech like some of my esteemed colleagues here uh, who know very well what they want you to do and you also understood what they want you to do with them. Uh, so the first thing that we can offer um, our, our new entrepreneur colleagues, budding entrepreneurs, is uh, if you are doing outreach anywhere in the country or in other countries where we are operating. Uh, if you have people in the field, if you are doing distribution uh, of your own products, we can always offer you Purit to also distribute. So you can be our distribution partners, you can be our outreach partners, you can help us in promoting Purit uh, to the base of the pyramid, you can help us to uh, communicate with uh, the low income households. And of course this will not be free, uh, I'm not a CSR or a charity, we are business. So we will have a business proposal or a business partnership to take it forward. So that's one bucket in which I see a lot of synergies with uh, organizations like yourselves. The second area that I see is uh, there's a lot of mobile enabled work which is happening now. And uh, uh, while we have solid data from urban middle class households, and we have panels and we have surveys and we have uh, all sorts of research flowing in from the best research agencies in the world. Uh, we don't have much data when we work with the poor or when we go to the rural areas. 
And I, I understand that a lot of organizations, a lot of startups are focusing on mining high quality data, uh, putting it in a, in a certain format which is easy to understand, it's real time, and that data would be very valuable to people like us who are trying to create a new business model at the base of the pyramid uh, to, to give them good water purifiers like Purit. So those kind of organizations who have something to offer uh, at the base of the pyramid are, are most welcome to uh, get in touch with us and we can, we can have a chat again on mutually beneficial terms. And the third part is uh, uh, some of the R&D startups, people who are in research, uh, developing new products, new ideas, um, specifically in the water space. If you have new technologies in the water space or new technologies which deal with water, uh, I could connect you with the R&D teams in Purit, in water, and uh, you know you can then uh, work with them. Uh, yes, we do insist on having the IP, but uh, uh, there are ways of uh, sharing the IP and there are ways of uh, uh, rewarding handsomely for the IP. So I think that should not be a concern at this point of time. So thank you very much. The right on board. Very interesting, uh, diverse range of issues we're all working on here. And I have, um, I have a question. For the entrepreneurs in the room, what's in it for them in those three areas? So it sounds like from what they're working on and doing the three areas that you mentioned, that brings a lot of value uh, to Unilever, and that's why it's a business proposition. But what's in it for the entrepreneurs in the room to work with you? Business. So they have business in it. Um, we don't have a formal scheme or system of uh, incubating entrepreneurs. We are not in the business of, at least in the water business, in the business of incubating entrepreneurs. But we deal with uh, all, all sides, sorts of organizations, all sizes of organizations. And if there is, uh, there is a value proposition which brings value, uh, we are willing to discuss business. And, and it would be steady and stable business. So. And... Sorry, and uh, two other advantages, more uh, intangible. Uh, one is uh, the opportunity to work with Unilever marketing. Unilever is considered to be a good uh, marketing uh, institution. And then uh, some of you might also benefit from the mentoring uh, which you might get <laughs> from, from people like us. Uh, that's in a lighter way, but you know, that's a huge intangible that you might get. And he welcomes reverse mentoring as well. Absolutely. Yeah, he absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So take it this way that, you know, uh, you all are the front end and I'm the hind end of, you know, fill in the blanks. <laughs> so, so there is mentoring to be done from both the sides. Deepak, because we have worked so closely with you at Intellicap, I have a question for you. So of all the people here, you have actually had the pleasure of working with most entrepreneurs and social enterprises. So what's one thing that you have noticed that simply doesn't work? What, what is a deal breaker typically in these relationships? Well, I think one deal breaker is uh, lack of clarity. I think when people, when people approach me, they possibly try to, uh, in their anxiety to make a good impression, they uh, tend to promise, over promise. Uh, on, on what they can do, and they don't really give a good uh, account of what is the real size of work that they're doing. So they tend to uh, blow up the work uh, that they're currently doing, or, or they don't really present a very uh, transparent picture. Uh, maybe because of the fear that uh, the other person will feel that you are you're so small, so you're inconsequential. But then what happens is that uh, uh, it forces us to go deep and you know, probe and probe and probe and, and then really get to the bottom. So one example is, I mean, somebody coming to you and saying that, well, I can solve all your communication problems and I can partner with, you know, Unilever has uh, 300,000 outlets in the country and, you know, we can partner with you and we can, uh, you know, provide you solutions which, are, uh, which can solve all your problems with your 300,000 outlets. And then you ask the person that, you know, tell me how many... Currently, your model is being in how many? So they say, well, this is an alpha model. We have, it's in 20 outlets that we have done. And you know, in the next two years, we plan to reach 750 outlets. So then you know, there's a disconnect in what we are talking. 
Um, so I think, I mean, nothing wrong with being alpha or beta or whichever stage, but one has to give a very transparent and clear picture of what you can bring to the table, uh, which makes the whole conversation uh, more productive. Right. Thank you all. And uh, at this point, I think we should go to the audience because this was supposed to be their pitch to you. So yeah. it doesn't really matter what Nisha and I think about there. We asked yeah. our questions already, so now it's up to you guys. I uh, would only request that don't make it a reverse pitch. So yeah, please ask, no pitches yeah, back. Don't pitch us back. <laughs> Just ask your question. <laughs> Any questions? If not, can we announce the winner? Okay. <laughs> We've secretly been choosing a winner. <laughs> Any questions? Okay. There we have. I, th I think that the audience should really, this is an opportunity to grill us, which yeah. never happens and probably will never happen again. So <laughs> yeah. you guys and should really be tough. We're always tough on you guys. And I don't know if you guys noticed, uh, they all very graciously agreed to give their email IDs away. So. Did you make a note of those? Good. So. Yeah, uh, my question is to Deepak. Uh, Deepak, uh, once is trying to understand uh, why companies like HUL, which has products, which has potential, uh, potential value uh, for the poor and the rural markets, uh, has not really invested in trying to see how to get these products out there and how to invest more in the R&D of these products to make the price points more enable, amenable to those markets. What, uh, is it a pure business decision that prevents that? Uh, you know, from an from a inclusive business perspective, why haven't investments really gone in there? Well, that's a, that's a good, I think that's a good question. But I, I'm not sure if it's the correct impression. Um, if you, if you go to a rural grocery shop in India and in Africa and many other parts of the world, if, if, you, if you go to the smallest kiosk, let's say a Duka in East Africa or a, or a uh, grocery shop anywhere else, uh, you are likely to see uh, a bunch of Unilever uh, products in the shelves. And these products are not there because they are uh, necessarily the most expensive. They are there because they are the most competitive. And secondly, uh, what if, I don't know if you know, but uh, uh, Unilever was the first organization who brought sachets. You know, most of the products into sachets uh, were brought by Unilever. So what that came out of an insight that uh, while the poor people would like to use, they have the same aspirations. So a poor woman would like to look as beautiful as a rich woman. But she may or may not be able to afford a shampoo. And she may not be able to afford the price of a big shampoo bottle. So Unilever was the first organization to come up with a small sachet, uh, which she can use and once in a while. Um, if you look at Life Boy Soap, which is you know, used by every household, sunlight, uh, rin, uh, et cetera, et cetera, there's a host of products. You look at Purit, uh, which is a classic example of, uh, uh, there are 10 million Purits installed in India alone as of now, and a, a large number of them in, in rural areas. So I'm not sure uh, that that is the case. But yes, I take your point. Much more can be done to reach the poor households, and which may not necessarily always be by reducing the price. Uh, there may have to be investments in education, investments in outreach, and uh, if those investments have to be made, then sometimes the price points cannot be broken uh, beyond a certain level. So possibly that is the impression uh, carried, but a lot of work is happening in that direction. Hello, yeah. I'll play devil's advocate over here. So I work with water company in Paris and developing social business plan for them. What's funny was they were using reverse osmosis technologies for the poor people. But what they, what, but what they didn't think, they can simply use water harvesting. You know, harvest the water, use the clean, clean, clean drinking water for drinking, but they were not. And similarly for, um, for, for, for education, I mean, there's so much of talk about technology and education, <coughs> but nobody talks about teaching art, you know, just how to paint, or how to draw a nice sculpture, or um, how to cut nice haircuts, or how to make nice fashionable clothes. I mean, these are all value-added products. You don't need technology for them. You need nice mentoring, nice close interaction. And that's what generates value. 
So, so one has to be kind of practical. I mean, also on the devil advocate side, if you look at shampoo, does a poor woman need a shampoo? I mean, making a nice, glossy advertisement to titillate a poor person and lowering his self-esteem by asking him to buy a shampoo, it's stupidity. Because a poor person doesn't really need a shampoo or a fair lovely clean cream. So, so frankly, I'm frankly to all the corporates over here, you guys have to be more uh, critical of yourself when you kind of, you know, put forth the technology uh, as the <coughs> only way of uh, creating solutions because solutions can be really simple. Yeah? Thanks. Everybody can respond. Everybody can respond to that. Everybody's <laughs> responding to that one. <laughs> uh, sure, before, uh, yeah. before he goes off on that, but let me just sort of uh, give that pitch. See, it is like this. Technology is only an enabler. When you teach somebody to become a better student and you enable that student, you light that spark in that student to go out and become someone, right? That is a great thing to do, right? Which otherwise the child didn't get. Number two, when you have a virtual classroom where you are training people, like I gave you some examples, I didn't give all the examples, retail, uh, somebody to go work in a shopper stop, for example, somebody to go work in your local uh, Kirana store, or somebody to teach them tally so that they can go get a better job. This is putting livelihoods back as corporate India expands to the rural areas and you sort of grow. So this is increasing their wallet share in the rural areas where they live, not necessarily that they have to come and migrate into the cities, right? So yes, it is a corporate responsibility to ensure that you don't disrupt or contribute to this massive change, right? <coughs> and we are very cognizant of that. So in our complete ecosystem, the question is when you put in technology, the technology is so simple that, you know, if something goes wrong with it, we just pull it down, put a fresh box and we go away. And for that, we make use of a local fellow to go and do that change. You don't send a very expensive engineer from a city going down to a remote rural village and then coming back. Other questions before we get to... Uh, yeah, I, I, I was just going to respond that in, in general that, sure, sure. Um, for example, on YouTube, our YouTube platform, uh, you know, there are these videos available of how to do better haircuts and how to do these things. So it is available. It's, it's not like it's not available. It's not accessible. But it's also like a demand, right? We, I don't think we... Uh, I mean, this is a fine line between corporate responsibility and sort of corporations having an agenda and pushing things. I think that whatever people demand is what's, what's going to surface. So, you know, we're not out there promoting fair and lovely or and not, not picking up fair and lovely, but, you know, promoting XYZ product. <laughs> but if consumers de demand that, like, you know, there's also like a certain demand that needs to be fulfilled. And, and, and this, you know, this goes across a lot of things. You know, you talk about tobacco, you talk about liquor and, you know, a lot of things. And, and where's, where's the line that should be drawn uh, by a corporation, it's, you know. So what Google adhere, adheres to is, is we have a court of law, and so whatever's illegal, for example, uh, we, there are certain products we don't market in India because they're considered illegal. Um, for, you can't advertise guns or pornography and things like that on Google. So, you know, they're, they're, we just follow the court of law. Yeah, I'll just add really quickly, I know there's other questions, but um, I think for the entire panel, nobody's proposing a solution to education. Everybody is just trying to facilitate uh, progress in different directions. And I do recommend that if anybody wants to learn how to cook a certain dish or how to put on mascara or, um, I don't know, build a bench, they go on YouTube and they see that there's always <laughs> information out there. It's just a matter of seeking it out now with the internet. Right. Go on. Yes. Maybe. Why don't both of you go and we'll see questions. Uh, hello. Yeah, hi, Sam. Prerak, uh, two quick questions. Harsha, one to you that uh, when you uh, are saying you incubate and support uh, small enterprises, do you look for a proven track record? Because throughout the conference, I was seeing a lot of players saying that, you know, you have reached a certain stage, have achieved some sales, and we come in. So do you come in at earlier stages when people are prototyping? And second is for Deepak after that, that I'm a user of Purit and maybe I'm a part brand ambassador for you because I've got three, four more friends to adapt it. I really love your product. But we were just generally discussing this a month back that is it possible to build a big Purit for a community? Like I work closely with primary health centers. What if there was a huge uh, Purit kind of a device which was much bigger and people who come to take medicines there, uh, they can get water also there. So have, are you working on these initiatives? 
Should let's we take, take a another more. question. Yeah. Let's take a few more and then come back. Yeah. Yeah, I have uh, two questions. One for HUL and another for Google. Uh, for Google, you have a lot of free tools available for NGOs and non-profit. Why not any technology free for for-profit social enterprises? For what? For Why not you have tools and free technology for for-profit social enterprises? Why only uh, NGOs? Is it like only NGOs are doing good for the society? Do you use yeah. Gmail? Do you use Gmail? Yeah, but do the you technology you talked about <laughs> it. I, I do pay for it indirectly. <laughs> No, we, we do. We, we have a lot so of Google, I, Google I search. Do you pay for Google search. I do YouTube. pay for Google search. I do pay for Google. You do? A lot, not directly, but maybe my data and the... Uh, like Google is earning in some or the other way, right? Google's not... <laughs> <laughs> so, for but, schools... But the no, 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 no. technology that you mentioned about for... I'm sorry, I can't. I can answer. So, for schools in particular, which I was talking about, we do have Google apps for educators, which are entirely free. There's no advertising, if that's what you're referring to. Gmail, Calendar, Google Drive, your free storage, that is entirely free. So if you're a school, you should be taking advantage of that. Uh, it's called yeah. Google Apps for Educators. And same with startups and entrepreneurs. I think, you know, Google, yeah. uh, Google tries as much we do. So I, like I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, that, and you mentioned nonprofits and also for entrepreneurs and startups. And, uh, you know, like, and, you know a, lot of the, a lot of the stuff is, is pretty much free. Uh, like consumers don't pay direct. We have some obviously some applications on the business side for large corporates or companies that are 20, 30 people, um, you know, Google Apps, there is, a, there is a paid version. And I think we're always looking at, even when we look at these paid versions, I think like we're always looking at how we can make it very accessible to people. So even the paid version um, is, is very low cost. It's the, it's, I, I feel, and obviously I'm a little biased, that for the amount of money that you spend, it's the best solution that's available. Um, but, you know, it, and I think this is where the marketplace decides. If, the, if someone does come out with better solutions, then the market will naturally gravitate uh, towards that. Um, so I think, you know, uh, you know, but if there's any suggestions, anything specific, I mean, we're available and you think there's certain tools that should be made for free that are not today, uh, you know, we'd be glad to talk to you and, and see what we can do. Can Thank I have so Harsha and Deepak respond very quickly and we have to close after that? Because yeah, so uh, to the earlier question, uh, so fundamentally if you take an innovation process, idea, pilot, commercialization, we kind of come the other way around. Because in India, the challenge always is how do you commercialize? I already said graveyard of innovation pilots. So what we do is we work with the startup. So for that, we need you to have either a proof of concept, prototype or product. So if you have a PowerPoint, it's very hard for us to work given our philosophy. So as soon as you give us that, we put it out in the field, do commercial pilots, we fund it, so we get a sense whether it's going to work, not work, what issues are there, and then kind of take it from there. So we need to have something, either a software or a hardware that you can play around with. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, so first I must thank you for, for you know, uh, telling me that you love Purit. I also love my Purit. And <laughs> it brings... That wasn't a plug. <laughs> brings me to a very interesting point that, uh, which the earlier... Uh, question related to was uh, why should things be beautiful, including poor women? Um, I think uh, things of beauty are extremely important, and people who have a purit at home, they also love it partly because it's a very good-looking device. And and I know that in a lot of low-income households where I go in, uh, purit is always kept in the pride of place at home. So it has really the central location of home is a purit. And second is an unintended benefit. Uh, Purit, of course, reduces diarrhea, uh, but it also has great tasting water. So there was this survey done, in, I mean, a study done in Chennai, where in a slum in Chennai, uh, 200 households, uh, slum households, used Purit for a year, and diarrhea reduced by about 50%. The reason was, of course, not only because the product was technically good, but because the water was so good tasting, that children insisted on drinking water from Purit. And therefore, this was an unintended uh, benefit of, of uh, something which, you know, a, a good tasting water gave rise to a significant public health benefit. So, uh, I mean, uh, I think uh, that's, that's my response to, uh, to this. Can we give all of our pitches a round of applause? <laughs> How many entrepreneurs in the room would, would now consider working uh, with one of these corporates? 
Raise your hand. Oh, that's All right. awesome. How many are still absolutely not sold on working with the gorillas or the forests or the spaceships? Go on. Oh, oh there you go. have skeptics. Everyone will be around for a bit. Um, well, most of the panelists will be around for a bit for any questions and continued business discussions. But we want to thank you all for your attention post-lunch and thank all of our panelists again for, uh, for taking the stage and pitching back to you guys on, on how you can partner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.